Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming out today. Uh, Sheriff Spurlock has an update for you on a 1985 uh, homicide case. He'll give you some more information on that, but just real quick, I'll uh, do the spelling of his name for you. It's Tony Spurlock, T-O-N-Y-S-P-U-R-L-O-C-K. Um, after he gives you the updated information, feel free to ask some questions. Just know that this is still an open case. So there's little information that he's going to be able to provide you beyond what he gives you right now. Um, there will be some photos displayed up here as well. And you can fill out a records request form in the back of the room. And uh, records will get that to you. You can just drop it off at the uh, records clerks up front. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to the sheriff. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for uh, being here today. Uh, as Lauren said, my name is Tony Spurlock. I'm the Douglas County Sheriff. And this is a this is one of those bittersweet days. Um, we uh, have uh, been working on a cold case for over 36 years, and it has come to a uh, conclusion to, to the point to where we now have someone in custody, and we will hand it over to the to the prosecution for the uh, for the remainder of this uh, seeking justice. So I want to tell you a little just a bit a little bit about the case. This is an interesting case. Uh, I happen to have been involved in, with it from 1985. Uh, there was also a, an extortion attempt on the family in 1990, and um, uh, we've been working on that case since that time. In November 21, 1985, an individual that we've later we've since identified as Michael Jefferson. Uh, entered Roger Dean's family home in Lone Tree. Um, there was a scuffle inside the home. Uh, it appears that he was trying to rob him. And uh, a short time later, the suspect uh, shot Roger Dean five times, who uh, unfortunately later died uh, while en route to the hospital. 36 years has continued. We've been doing this work. And I have to tell you that um, this is one of those kinds of things where uh, we have a lot of people to thank, and I'm going to do that here in just a little bit of minute, in a, in a minute. But um, our genealogist uh, who is here, investigative um, genetic genealogist, Michelle Kennedy, started to work on this case and was able to develop um, DNA genealogy. It's, she's she's going to get me in trouble for this right here because I don't know the exact. She's just magic work. Um, identify the suspect that we were able to hand off to the detectives. And from that point, we have been uh, working on this case. It's important to, to realize that, that this case has been going on for 36 years. It's been opened a number of times, but it wasn't until this newest technology and the ability for us to uh, identify individuals through genetic genealogy that we came to this point. Uh, in March of this year, uh, detective O'Harold, who's the lead uh, detective in this case, um, drafted a search warrant and an arrest warrant for the suspect, Michael Jefferson, where we went to Los Angeles along with members of uh, the Douglas County Sheriff's Office impact team and um, made the arrest uh, with the assistance of the LA uh, Police Department. We had also had folks that went to Louisiana, which is his home. And I will tell you that uh, Michael Jefferson, uh, his date of birth is 3-26-57, a 64-year-old male who resides in New Orleans, Louisiana. And we had officers that were there that were doing work on uh, assisting us in trying to uh, develop uh, more information on the case. Um, I had the pleasure of being with the detectives when we went to L.A. Uh, to work on this case for a little while and when the arrest was made. And I'll have to tell you that um, the assistance of a number of people I'm going to thank here in a minute was very, very um, uh, helpful and which would made this case come to its success. Uh, but on April 6, just a few days ago, Michael Jefferson was extradited from the Los Angeles County Jail to the Douglas County Jail, uh, where he is still sitting on a no-bond hold for the crimes of murder in the first degree and kidnapping. As I said a number of times, we can't talk a lot about the particulars of the case. The district attorney will share a little bit of information, but this case is now proceeding to the criminal justice uh, prosecution side, so I won't be able to go into a lot of details, but I do want to say a couple things. I really want to thank some people. One of them is right here, 
uh, Michael Mills from uh, Metro Denver Crime Stoppers, who played a major role in helping us uh, fundraising and being able to get us some resources so we could get this case to where we're at today. Uh, of course, Mitch Morrissey and United Data Connect was also very helpful in, in guiding us down the path a little bit. Colorado Bureau of Investigations and their Forensic uh, Services Unit. I cannot uh, say enough about the Colorado Bureau of Investigations for not only what they did in 1985 at the murder and collecting the evidence and helping us proceed, uh, uh, protect it in its pristine condition to get it to where we're at today. So Colorado Bureau of Investigations did a great job and I'd like to thank them. And of course, our crime lab, Unified Metropolitan Forensic Crime Lab, uh, played a small role in it as well. But definitely the Los Angeles Police Department, Southeast Division, Robbery and Homicide, those guys were great. They did an excellent job and helped us. And we probably would not have been able to apprehend this individual without their assistance. Um, special agents from the Louisiana Attorney General's Office, the special agents from the FBI Denver Field Office, the Denver Police Department, the Arapahoe County Sheriff's Office. Um, but I want to I want to personally thank, and if you give me the, the courtesy to do that, the, the folks that really did a great job on this is Captain Darren Weekly, who's in charge of our investigations division, uh, Lieutenant Myra Byes, um, our cold case corporal Mike Trindle, who's here, our cold case detective Michael Harold, investigative uh, genetic genealogist Michelle Kennedy, cold case investigative specialist Stacy Spurlock, and the cold case review team, which has a number of people on it, which is a volunteer group of people that volunteer their time to work on this case, and others, Valerie Garcia, Eric Fadness, and Dr. Mark Montano. And then, of course, Sergeant Joel White and his team from the impact team. And then uh, special thanks to Andy Smith, who is our crime scene technician, who's really done a great job in helping us put all these things together. Um, this is a great case today. We do have uh, family members here today. We're not going to um, make them available for any interview, so I just wanted to let you be aware of that. Um, but it is so important that um, we focus on now the prosecution of this case. And uh, what I want to do is introduce uh, the district attorney for the 18th Judicial District, John Carr. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here today. My name is John Kellner. I'm the district attorney for the 18th Judicial District. That covers Arapahoe, Douglas, Elbert, and Lincoln Counties. In 2013, I had the privilege of helping to start our cold case unit at the DA's office. And this is one of the cases that in the very beginning, we reopened, we looked at with our partners at the Douglas County Sheriff's Office. But at the time, there was not enough to identify a suspect or to move forward. But the level of dedication shown by our law enforcement partners to get us where we are today is truly remarkable. And that has to do with the incredible efforts from the folks at the Douglas County Sheriff's Office our partners at the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, our friends at Metro Denver Crime Stoppers, who have helped us on a number of cases involving genetic genealogy and are helping us get to a point where we can seek justice for the victims in this case. Now, I should tell you a few things. Uh, number one, and probably most important if you take anything away from what I say today, is that this defendant is presumed innocent unless and until he is proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. A few other things. This defendant is charged with murder in the first degree after deliberation. He's also charged with murder in the first degree, a felony murder charge. And finally, there is a kidnapping charge. Now, as we move forward in this process, we may amend or adjust these charges, but that's where they stand today. Now, at the time of this offense, in 1985, there's a little difference in how the sentencing structure works from today versus 1985. Uh, and he will be basically moving forward through this process with the possibility of being sentenced under the 1985 statute if he were to be convicted. That would carry with it for a murder in the first degree conviction, uh, the penalty of life in prison, but with the possibility of parole after 40 calendar years. Now, I would urge anyone who knows this individual, this defendant, who might recognize him from the 1980s to reach out to the Douglas County Sheriff's Office because like any other case, we rely on the community. It's not just science that gets us here. 
But if anybody recognizes this individual, if anybody has information that might be pertinent to this investigation, I urge you to bring it forward now. The next hearing that is scheduled for this case is next week on the 14th. It is a status conference where we will be handling some preliminary matters in the case and then setting it for a preliminary hearing in what is known as a proof evident or presumption great hearing where the judge will determine if we have enough evidence to continue to hold this defendant without bail. So that's what's happening in terms of the process here moving forward. I thank everybody for being here today and I truly thank our partners in law enforcement for their continuous work on this case. And as uh, the sheriff said, I cannot really say too much uh, else. I would encourage you to uh, check out the affidavit to learn more of the specific facts of the case. Sheriff? Does anyone have any questions you, that we will make an attempt to uh, answer if we can? I can tell you that he did re reside here in Colorado in 1985 and did so for a period of time. Um, he does have a residence in Louisiana, but he has family members in LA and that's where he was apprehended. So that's that connection. Other than that, we're still in the middle of that investigation and the prosecution pro uh, side, so we won't be going into great detail of the relationship. Sure, talk about uh, this, we, we've covered these cold cases seemingly quite a bit, and the United States Connect, and it's amazing to those of us not in law enforcement or investigations, but this particular one, isn't this a little more personal to you? I mean, you literally worked this case. Can you touch on that? Well, it, it's, it, it is a, it's not as personal as the, the surviving victims, but I will tell you that um, I uh, was at the scene in 1985. I was a lead detective and uh, worked with on the partner case, the connecting case on the extortion, and then all the way through when uh, John was talking about the uh, 2013 review, I've been involved in all of those reviews. So it is um, very unique in that circumstance, that's what I would call it, is unique. But it is very satisfying to know that we have uh, technology today that we could utilize from evidence that was collected 36 years ago and maintained appropriately and properly and bring us to a suspect that we can now present to the court as, a, as an individual who is responsible for the murder. Can you share what evidence um, the grand jury would use to get the person in for trial? Um, DNA evidence. Um, we're not going to share. We're not going to share of what we got it off of, or how it was obtained, and those kinds of things at this point, because there's a lot of steps that we need to go through on the prosecution side. So, but sorry, I couldn't answer all that particular. John, could you talk about the way these types of cases, um, as they're more prevalent, seemingly uh, over the, the past few years, how they stand up in court and how the technology is perceived or received from from the court? I could probably talk about that for a very long time, unfortunately. <laughs> you know, what we've seen over the years is, uh, you know, an evolution, obviously, in DNA technology, and then the acceptance of that technology in court by jurors. Uh, I mean, there's not too long ago, if you were to think back into the 90s, you know, it was a new thing. It was not well received. It was very difficult to present to a jury. You know, fast forward now, people expect to see DNA, and they expect to see DNA evidence in cases. So. You know, I'd, I'd say that's a positive in the way these things are received by juries. But just the incredible and amazing thing about this is that the advancement in genetic genealogy, so taking something that you know, was preserved from decades ago and being able to extract DNA and then compare it across uh, you know, different DNA databases that we have access to throughout the country and, and arrive at where we are today, that's the incredible story. Uh, and frankly, it's something we're seeing more and more in the state of Colorado because of local law enforcement's dedication to this type of investigation, putting resources specifically into this, CBI working with us, and then our community partners 
and Metro Denver Crime Stoppers for helping to fund some of it. Anything else? Sure. No. Can you yes. uh, a little bit about what we know about Roger Dean? Sure. Um, I can tell you this. Uh, Roger Dean was a businessman uh, that worked in the Denver area, um, had his family. Uh, they grew up in the Denver metro area, obviously bought a new home in Douglas County, where unfortunately that's where um, uh, the individual came into and, and he was uh, um, killed at that location. Um, Roger married, had a family, children, um, and, um, you know, for all accounts was a, a prospering uh, businessman. And what we do know, not only from 1985, but today, um, he, he was very well known by a lot of people in the Denver metro area. And so, uh, obviously, you know, we've done our best to reach out to all of those folks to see what we can do to, as uh, Dia Kellner said, very important if anyone knows anything or knew anything or heard anything in 1985 or 1990 during the extortion, please uh, reach out to us and share. Uh, unfortunately, when these cases are 36 years old and you have folks that are getting older, we unfortunately are losing some of our witnesses uh, to do natural causes. And so if anyone has any information about Roger Dean, his family, or uh, the suspect or any information related to any one of them, uh, please contact my office um, at our tip line that uh, can be seen on our uh, dcsheriff.net. If there's nothing, nothing else, thank you all very much for being here. I re we really do appreciate it. You guys play a major role in this and helping us get information out to the community so they know what their law enforcement and uh, government's doing, but more importantly, how we can extract information from those who don't even know that this case is here that might have something for us. So thank you for doing your part in the criminal justice side. So thank you all very much.